Uh, I'm just to, to going to introduce the, uh, the project just briefly, and uh, other people involved in it uh, will um, uh, discuss results and things like that. Um, that's all the people involved in alphabetical order with uh, the ones who are speaking highlighted. There we go. Um, the, the official title of the project is the application of control traffic in the low rainfall zone. But for five years, it was um, funded by GRDC to the tune of two million, actually it's two and a quarter million, uh, and about that much cash and in-kind contributions from the project uh, partners. Um, we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, and there they are. Uh, ACFA saw, saw the um, project um, brief or tender that was put up by GRDC uh, and we decided that we would um, endeavour to put together a big consortium of, of players including state departments of which there are two um, and farming systems groups and other partners and, and bid for the whole two million dollars as it was then um, project. Um, that partnership was put together and the project's been run on that basis ever since. It's a true, true genuine partnership project. Um, basically, its aim, in a nutshell, was to wasn't to try and get much more control of traffic uh, adopted in the low rainfall zone in in five years. It was to try and find answers to the questions that growers, grain growers in particular, were asking about CTF in that zone, where adoption was only about four percent five years ago, compared to in the twenties. Uh, pretty much elsewhere, yeah, Wimmera and Victoria, Western Australia was increasing, high rainfall zone in Victoria was increasing, but the low rainfall zone had very low adoption. And the questions arose in particular because it's got low rainfall zone, obviously it's a low rainfall zone, the soils are mainly light soils and people didn't quite understand compaction in those light soils as well as they did in some of the heavier ones. Farms are very large, paddocks are very large, equipment was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and growers were saying things, well, have I really got soil compaction? What, what's it doing to my crops? What's it doing to my farm? If I, if I do go into CTF, what's going to happen? Am I soil going to self-repair? Uh, am I going to get more yield? All, all these sorts of questions were going through their minds and, and there were no answers. So we spent five years endeavouring to, uh, to find those answers. We set up four research sites on four typical soil types across that zone which starts right in the Air Peninsula and goes up about 1,500 kilometres up to near Condobal and it's a massive geographical project. Um, and also we work very closely with a whole bunch of farming systems groups, five of them in fact, um, and they help with all the research sites, they help with a whole lot of other things such as those things that you can see there. Uh, and the point of this presentation when we get to the to the people who talk about the technical issues and the results was to answer those those questions and there are the five farming systems groups who've been major partners in the project and we can't thank them enough for their help and cooperation and the way that they uh, have been uh, instrumental in getting our results out to their members and things like that so Next up is uh, Rebecca Mitchell from Ancarta, Victoria, who had a great deal to do with the project over most of the, not quite all the five years, but most of them. Thanks, Chris. And I think that that's a really good point there is the local relevance through the Farming Systems Group partners. We always wonder, you know, what about my patch and how is it relevant to me? And because we had a big geographical area to cover, um, these five Farming Systems Groups were really instrumental in making sure that we could answer that question, what about my patch? So we did 20 different development activities um, through those five years and I don't have time to talk about them all so I'm going to just talk about four of those today. So luckily most of the things I'm going to talk about has been covered in other people's presentations but ours is results from our low rainfall, area, our low rainfall zone area. So the effect of wheel trafficking on yield. So we've got a lot of numbers that have been thrown around and James, you threw a lot around as well. And so I'm glad mine fit in there, so that's good. So we had the question, the hypothesis. Grain yield will be lower on a wheel track due to increased crushing damage and compaction effects of machinery. Therefore, moving to a CTF system will reduce these wheel traffics and increase paddock yield. So we assess this through taking hand harvests and biomass yield cuts from 60 sites 
across the four regions that we're working in over the three years. So that map there shows the, the area that we've covered where um, all those samples have been taken from. So what did we find? So we found that there was on average a 15% yield penalty when we were taking the samples um, on the wheel tracks. So there was a range from negative seven to 35, as you always get in science, a big range, but a 15% average um, increase when we move off the track. So therefore, I went really conservative and saying, you know, average trafficking about 40%, but there's been a lot of talk about more about those, that 50% about our average trafficking. And then we can get to 15% of the CTF system. So therefore, if we do those calculations that we can get to a 4% yield increase in the CTF system in the low rainfall zone. So some of you are asking questions about yield. So there's an there's the answer that we got in our project. So WA, what did they get? About 18 to 46%, Queensland 7 to 15%. So as we know in our low rainfall zone, our um, yields are generally lower and therefore our margins are gonna be lower as well. So hence our 4% sitting just below those that we've observed elsewhere. Okay, the next question. What about energy used in the CTF system in the low rainfall zone? Looking at draft and rolling resistance. So our hypothesis, energy required to pull seed instruments through unpacked soil will be less. Energy to tow machinery will be lower when driving on a wheel track. And this will save energy and fuel in a CTF system when we drive on permanent wheel tracks. So in 2016, we had um, some PhD students come down from Queensland and uh, took, uh, undertook research in our area. So they went to um, four different sites. So we can see the sites there. And Alistair Murdoch covered one of those that was his, um, his site as well. So what was our results? What did we find? So there was a 9.6% reduction in energy when we're trying to pull the tines through uncompacted soil. The force required to pull them was 25% less. So that gives us about a 15% fuel savings across CTF farms in the low rainfall zone. In Queensland, they saw much higher results, 75% reduction in the draft resistance and 15% fuel savings across the paddocks. So another question, understanding compaction. How can we kind of visualize the compaction that we have in our paddock? And a lot of the presenters have actually used penetrometer data, which has been really great. So this is a really good tool that we found in our project to, to visualize and to feel the compaction. We all like being able to touch things and feel things. And so a penetrometer is really, really good at doing that. So as part of the project, we use a digital cone penetrometer and we worked really closely re with RIMIC to get a cone penetrometer that actually now Bluetooths the data instantly to a laptop. So when we're in the field, we can actually see instantly the compaction graphs as we're going down the soil profile. So some of you might be more familiar with the pencil method or the, the bloody pencil method. So putting a double sided pencil in the ground and if it hurts your finger, well then it's compacted. Or we have a little bit more high tech, we go to the steel rods. So just welding them together. Um, or we've got with the, the dial so we can actually understand some of the measurements. And then we've got the, the cone penetrometer that we used. So this is just an example of kind of what the data from the cone penetrometer looks like. You can group it up into different things that you're trialing. So whether it was on the fence line, on a wheel track, on a bed, and it averages, that middle line is an average, so it shows you an average instantly of the penetrometer resistance that you're experiencing. So how do we use this data? We collected lots and lots of different penetrometer readings, and it was really useful to understand compaction depth. So there we can see the point where the compaction is occurring when we're moving um, into the trafficked areas. Or it can help us identify the wheel tracks. So there we, we can see a higher level of um, resistance and therefore that was one of our wheel tracks. So if you can spot that you live near one of these yellow dots, we actually have six of these um, digital cone penetrometers that are sitting with the farming systems groups to be used by the farming community. So if you've got an interest in understanding your um, penetrometer resistance and compaction, then get in touch with one of these farming systems groups because uh, they're there to be used. So the last one I'm going to talk about is case studies. So I really like case studies because they're about sharing experiences and learnings from individual farmers who have gone through a journey 
or are on the journey into CTF. So we did 15 of these as part of the project and they covered the, the, the wide um, area that we were working in. So there's a list of our case studies and um, the farmers and then also some of the focuses that they had. So we had some talking about hay and livestock in the CTF system. They all said that hay doesn't really fit. That's one of those times that you just have to go off track. Um, we control amelioration, innovative equipment, investigating CTF. So we had a few that were uh, wanting to move into it, but um, sharing their story about why they haven't just yet. So what were some of the common things that were coming through those case studies? So I was really happy because when I uh, was reading them all in depth, they were all talking about a 15 to 20 percent fuel saving observation in their system. So that's what we measured and that's what the farmers were saying as well. So that's really great. So um, also they were talking about their current um, traffic footprint about the 15 to 20 percent. And also this is a really, really common thing that was coming through. So. The conversion wasn't really expensive, um, it was really important to plan, and it was really about the mindset, so to change your mindset and expect that it's going to be a few years. So these are two of the quotes I really like, do adequate homework to make the transition correctly, and one of the biggest issues is your mindset and getting your head around. This is a farming system. So I mentioned that we did 20 activities. What are some of the other ones that we did? So we looked as well at the impact of compaction on soil biology, and Peter's going to talk about that later. Uh, we had a lot of soil pits, which were investigating compaction. Uh, we used the CTF calculator, where we then track man uh, with 100 of our farmers. So they got a report about their farming. Um, we ran some CTF machinery workshops with James Hagen, who came down and presented uh, nine workshops with our farmers. We were involved in a nitrous oxide emission project, so looking at the impact of um, wheel tra trafficking on emissions. Uh, we looked at wheel track erosion, and we also did a lot of work at investigating deep ripping, as which has been talked about a lot. So I'm going to invite Kate up, and she's going to talk about our deep ripping part of the project. Okay, thanks, Beck. So in 2017, a uh, research trial was set up at Loxton, and after seeing uh, yields double from the field, field pea crop that was put in, um, the project decided to further explore the role of deep ripping in the Mallee. So in 2018, five ripping sites were established, three in Victoria and two in South Australia. These were conducted across a range of soil types commonly found in the Mallee. All the sites um, received 40 to 60 per cent less than their growing season average rainfall. Um, so a good indicator of just how dry the soil conditions were uh, throughout the year. Um, each site was designed slightly differently, but they all looked at ripping compared to a non-ripped area. The ripping treatments were all imposed prior to sowing last year using a 3.42 metre wide nine tine agri-plough deep ripper, except at Peruna, where the grower used his own 12 metre wide equipment. All the sites were sown to wheat, but they all had different uh, paddock histories. So I'm now going to go through each site and talk a little bit about the different yield responses that we observed. Uh, so first up is Wimalang. This is a picture of the site from looking, taken from the dune looking over the swale. The dune was a sand over sandy loam and the swale was a sandy loam over clay loam. Uh, this site was designed and replicated six times so that we could statistically analyse our results. We unfortunately didn't receive our targeted depth of greater than 30 centimetres. We had uh, a lot of difficulty getting the deep ripper down and be able to be pulled through the soil. Um, so we're attributing this uh, issue that we had due to the, the soil type, the soil conditions that we ripped in, they were incredibly dry, um, as well as the horsepower of the tractor that we used. Um, and this did actually influence our results. We unfortunately didn't see any significant difference between any of our treatments on the swale, um, and the same was on the dune. What we did see was that there was a clear overall yield increase on the dune compared to the swale, and this was a trend that was observed in the Wimlang region in that growing season last year. 
Uh, also note that there was an extra treatment added of Sterify in the topsoil, and this was just to mimic conventional practice in that area, um, and it also had not much of an impact on yield. Um, our next site is Kinabula. This uh, was a sandy loam and sandy clay loam topsoil and a heavier subsoil of a medium to heavy clay. Um, it was positioned over a gently undulating paddock um, and this image was taken when the roofing treatment which was imposed, which was in March, um, and sort of just showing just how dry the conditions were. A different tractor was used and we were able to get down to much greater roofing depth of 45 to 50 centimetres. Uh, the, we've got anecdotal evidence from the grower from his yield monitor that suggested that we actually got a negative yield response here. And when we did hand cuts at harvest, we also saw a slight negative yield um, response to our deep ripping. And we're suspecting this is due to exposing our roots to a hostile subsoil, um, either boron or high salts. Uh, Kinabula is located near a town called Birchip, and this region is very well known for its subsoils to contain boron to toxic levels, um, which do impact on plant production. Our last site in Victoria is Kulunon, um, and Alistair Murdoch yesterday, for those that were here, uh, would have heard a lovely overview that he did of this trial, so I won't go into too much detail, but it was on a sand. Um, we did get to ripping depths of 40 to 42 centimetres. This is a picture of the ripping with inclusion plates, and as you can see, it was quite rough. Uh, and as we heard, Alistair did not uh, roll after he imposed the ripping treatments, which was very different to our other sites where some form of rolling or scarifying took place. And as a result, we did actually see uh, a significant negative reduction in the plant establishment, but we still had plenty of plants available. I think it was 126 plants per square metre. Um, this trial also did look at recompacting the soil after deep ripping, but just for this presentation, we're going to focus on the non-recompacted treatments. So what we saw was that uh, both our rip treatments delivered a positive yield response. The rip with inclusion plates added an extra half a tonne per hectare, um, compared to the ripped and overall increased yields by 1.1 tonnes. Our first site in South Australia, Loxton, also had a positive yield response to deep ripping. It was also on a sandy soil and got down to ripping depths of 45 to 50 centimetres. This was taken in August and shows a nice uh, difference between our ripped and not ripped treatments. And this difference did also flow into yield. We got a uh, half a tonne to one tonne hectare yield increase from our roofing treatments, but this did depend on where you were positioned in the landscape. As you can see, the June he had a much greater response compared to the swale. Um, and it's also interesting to note that the roofing treatments yielded slightly more than those with the inclusion plates. Uh, our final site is Peruna, uh, also on the sandy soil and good roofing depths were achieved. Uh, the swale performed similarly to the Loxton site, increasing yields with both ripping and without, with increased yields with and without inclusion plates uh, by about a half a tonne hectare. But unfortunately, the June didn't quite behave as we expected. We do know that this site was severely impacted by multiple frosts. We also know that whilst the ripping depth of 45 to 50 centimetres was achieved, this wasn't consistent across the ripped areas. Um, and when we looked at the penetrometer data, there's also another possible explanation for why we saw um, the lack of response here. So this is the penetrometer data that we collected. Uh, again, it wasn't taken at field, field capacity, so just use the soil pressure values at the top there um, on the relative basis. Um, what you can see is in the green is our rip with inclusion plates, um, and we got they loosened, decreased the soil strength to a much greater extent than our non ripped and ripped treatments. The ripping uh, follows were similar to the non ripped treatment, and could be why that we didn't see much of a yield difference between those two. The inclusion plates, plants in the inclusion plate treatment may have been able to much easier access. Uh, nutrients and water through that top 35 centimetres compared to the other treatments. So, uh, in summary, a range of soil types were explored in our deep ripping project in 2018. Uh, we had a range of yield responses from positive, nothing, to slightly negative. 
There are a range of reasons why we possibly saw the results that we did, from the ripping depth, the soil type, the uh, subsoil constraints and mother nature. Um, and so hopefully some of the take home messages that can be taken away from these trials, uh, and I'm pretty much going to reiterate what we heard from Wayne Parker yesterday, is that it's very important to understand your soil type. Know what you're going to be exposing your crop roots to at depth. There could be a toxic subsoil, there might not be enough stored moisture there for the plants to access. Uh, understanding your ripping depth is also important. If you don't rip below that compacted layer, you're um, unlikely to see any yield response, and it's also very important to know where that compacted layer is. Uh, yield increases of grade one ton per hectare can be achieved, but this is really only on the sandy soils. And we did see some evidence that inclusion plates can further increase yields, although this wasn't consistent across all our sites. And now Peter's going to come up and talk to you about the research sites from the project. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the research component. GRDC, when they initiated this project, they asked for a research component, uh, and they asked for two main questions to be looked at, which was understanding the effects that high root resistance has on crop performance, and to determine if root resistance can self-repair. <clears throat> so, the way we thought the best way to look at this would be to find some CTF farms and to go and install some trafficking treatments on those farms. We did that using the heaviest equipment we could find on each farm, and we imposed four different treatments. Uh, the first treatment was just to control what the farmer practice was, and then we did an increase, what we call an increase in amount of potential um, um, compaction um, effect on the soils. So we did one pass uh, with the vehicle under dry conditions, we did one pass uh, of the vehicle under moist conditions, and then we did um, three passes uh, of the vehicle under moist conditions. Um, <coughs> excuse me. As Chris mentioned at the beginning, that we had four sites um, going over from South Australia uh, in the west right over to um, Lake Cajalico in the east. I'm going to highlight mainly just two of our most extreme sites, uh, which was Loxton, which was a deep sandy site. And um, if you look at this site, this picture, it's the particle size analysis. Uh, the blue lines is the clay content. So at Loxton, you can see we had less than 10% clay all the down, uh, all through the profile. Well, at uh, Kajelico, it was our heaviest site. Um, we had clay contents up to about uh, 30, up to 40% at depth. So um, from our very lightest sandy soil to our heaviest uh, uh, clay soil. They also varied most in soil water, in uh, rainfall, um, with Loxton being our lowest rainfall, um, with a growing season of 200, whereas Kajelico, um had uh, an average growing season of 300, although in one of our years in 16, as you might know, it was totally flooded. Um, this is what the sites uh, look like typically after the treatments were imposed. The dry trafficking, you can see, has done some sort of damage to the soil, and you can certainly see the trafficking marks on that. Um, but the three times wet trafficking, you know, considerably more effect uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the soil surface. So I'm going to jump straight to the results here, um, and probably these results can be interpreted differently depending on whether you're a supporter of CTF or you're not a supporter of CTF, so uh, probably know which side this crowd will go. So, um, on this graph, what I've got here is yield um, up this axis, and along here I've got the four treatments in increasing potential to cause damage to the soil from the control to the dry compaction, to the wet or dry compaction one pass, uh, to the wet compaction or damp compaction one pass, to the three uh, pass wet compaction. So for Loxton for our deep sands, these are results over the years. So 2015 was that, 2000, uh, that was wheat, 2016 wheat, 2017 peas, and 2018 barley. 
Now, I suppose from the CTF point of view, we can see that uh, the three times traffic in cause large yield decreases in every single year, <coughs> um, ranging from what 24% um, yield decrease up to 67% uh, yield decrease in this last season. So um, this traffic and treatment has caused significant yield penalties in every single year following. And I should emphasize, if I didn't at the start, that we only did the treatment once at the start of the budget. So there hasn't been a repeated treatment every year. This is residual effect from the treatment in the first year. However, the other treatments in many cases had very little effect. Uh, certainly up until this last year where we did see more effect, uh, strangely, from um, the lower traffic in treatment. So to some extent, the lower traffic in had no real response to yield effects, while the high traffic in had um, high and sustained uh, yield penalties. At Cargelico, um, what we see here is a 2015 wheat, 2016 wheat, and 2018 wheat, it was in a break crop in 2017. Um, when we saw the 2015 wheat, we saw a, a very large yield penalty, 40%, uh, which caused a, a large uh, financial significant difference. Um, in 2016, we saw no difference in potentially some yield increases in some of the treatments. Um, which was sort of disappointing, so only a one year effect in 2018 again no effect of the treatments, no residual effect of the treatments uh, at that site. But what we did do is we went and reinstalled that three times uh, wet treatment, uh, again, just before the 2018 sowing season on some spare plots that we had. And then we found we did actually got a very large 73% uh, yield decrease, very low yield in uh, season, but a very large yield decrease by putting that treatment in again. So we definitely had a one year effect, which we could repeat again in a subsequent year. And at the two other sites, which were sort of in intermediate, uh, um, Sandy Loam sort of sites, we had very little or uh, no effect uh, from the traffic and treatments. So quite a mixture of results there. Um, what are our sort of interpretation of those? I suppose the most important one to me is, despite uh, you know generations of farming, it is still possible if you move to heavier equipment to cause significant yield decreases. And farmers often are moving to heavy equipment. So um, there's certainly the potential to do more damage that will cause yield uh, decreases on your farms. And if I just talk about in terms of uh, after generations of farming, this is the penetrometer resistance that you've heard talked about a lot. This is our control treatment under normal farming practices. Uh, this is what happened after we put in our three times wet compaction. And you can see at Loxton, we caused a lot of uh, further penetrometer resistance at depth. But this is what we did in a fence line. where You can see it's extremely different to what would be under natural farming conditions. So that is the difference of, your, of farming to date and that's the effect of uh, using heavier equipment. Um, in most cases, only multiple uh, past traffic and treatments uh, appear to have made any uh, significant increase in yields. And we say we got very different responses at different sites with different soil types. So in the deep sands, yield penalties were significant and persistent. In the clay uh, or clay soils, yield penalties were only for a single season. And in the calcareous sort of red sandy loam, there was no yield penalties. So that might be a conclusion, but I suppose to me, as a research scientist, the whole question is why? Why are we getting these different sort of results? And I think a lot more of the research needs to be around understanding the responses we're getting to controlled traffic. And I've heard quite a lot of talks uh, saying, oh, you know, you know your soil. Well, what we really need to know is know what our responses are on those different soils and why the soils are causing that effect. When we asked farmers the causes of compaction, most of them said um, operations at high moisture content. 
And um, we tried to look at that by doing our wet and dry treatments, but unfortunately being a um, low rainfall uh, region and a low rainfall season when we started, actually the difference of water content when we, when we did the wet treatment and dry treatment wasn't that much different. So there's still a, a huge amount of research to understand exactly what difference the water content might make. The other large, uh, the other effect the farmer said was excessive machinery weight, and we've heard uh, other presentations talking about that. And I think probably that's you know really got to be an important focus of future research. Uh, we did uh, the compaction with very different uh, uh, equipments at the two sites. At Loxton, we used uh, a 24-ton chaser bin, while at Cargelico it was only an eight-ton spray rig. Now, if we start to look at the stress distributions in soil underneath those sorts of tyres, we can see very, very different stress distributions, much larger uh, stress distributions under those heavier tyres, even though they're larger tyres. And if you just look at a line graph of, of what the stress distribution is, this would be at Loxton, uh, this is at Cargelica, sorry, the other way around, um, this is at Cargelica, and this is at Loxton with the heavier weight. And if you take this sort of zone, we've said it's very difficult to understand, but the zone where compaction might occur, you can see at Cargelica we're probably only getting very shallow compaction, while at Loxton we're getting uh, the potential for very deep compaction, and that's certainly uh, verified by our penetrometer resistance which showed that we got that deep penetrometer, uh, deep uh, resistance to uh, penetrometer down deep, corresponding with the sort of zone down here that we wouldn't have got compaction at Cargelico. So understanding the physics is, is really important as we move forward, and, and one of the things we're trying to do now is incorporate that into sort of things like apps and crop models to say, okay, if we know we've got these sorts of effects of penetrometer resistance, can we change the root exploration uh, module within those models so that farmers can now run it over different years and different scenarios and it can be expanded out over more soil types. So very quickly, uh, just a few extra results. We've, this year we've done some uh, soil biology. Um, this is hot off the press, uh, this information. And you remember I said at Loxton that we got no response uh, to any of our traffic and treatments. Well, sorry, did I say that wrong? At Minipa, we got no um, uh, responses to any of our traffic and treatments, no yield decreases. Well, at Loxton, we got significant ones. When we look at the microbiomass, Interestingly, at Minipa, where we got no response, uh, we can also see that there's actually no difference uh, in microbiomass uh, across any of the treatments. While at Loxton, where we did get a yield decrease, we have got significant decreases in microbiomass with those treatments. Likewise, if we look at mycorrhizal fungi root colonization, uh, again, at uh, Loxton, at uh, Min Minipa, where we got no yield effect from the treatments, We've got no effect in microarrays of fungal colonization across any of the uh, treatments. While at Loxton, we've got a big decrease, even though the values, the values at Loxton are much smaller than the values at Minipa. In Minipa, there's no difference due to the treatments. So um, we've also got a relationship here between microbiomass and yield across those sites, and you can see the, the um, uh, lots and sites, we've got a you know, linear increase with uh, amount of biomass to yield, whereas at uh, Minipa, where we had no yield differences, we've also got a very, very small difference in microbiomass. So one of the questions now that we have in the heated debate with the biologists is, is the biology causing those differences and we've got no change in biology uh, um, and therefore no yield increase, or is the biology responding to the fact that we're getting yield decreases? Um, I suspect it's probably a mixture of the two where we're causing differences due to the uh, structural changes that's changing the biology. The biology is then feeding into uh, poor yields and the poor yields. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we saw at, um, at uh, Loxton an increase in effect. So our last year, last year's effects uh, due to trafficking were the largest effects we had over these years. So maybe we're getting into a cycle of lower yields, lower biology, lower even further, lower yields. Um, so um, take-home messages are now a bit more complex than just looking at the uh, original sites. Um, so um, 
First one, I suppose, is a sort of overall conclusion from the work done by Rebecca and Kate that many system benefits exist, and we've heard many talks talk about those, such as reduced fuel and reduced area of uh, low yielding in the wheel tracks. I think the important one to me is really that moving to heavy equipment, um, probably especially if used in wetter conditions, even though we've had uh, generations of farming across these sorts, of, is still likely to cause a significantly further damage to your soils. Uh, and that can't be compensated for by using wider tyres. We've heard a few talks about that, that, that uh, using wider tyres uh, and low pressure doesn't stop the compaction that's uh, at depth. Uh, the lack of natural remediation, at least in this uh, zone, in the low rainfall zone, means that the adoption of CTF alone um, <coughs> um, will probably only result in those, those system benefits that we talked about in, in the lower fuel because the soils will take a very, 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 very long time to recover. Um, and hence, I suppose, the great interest now in, in the use of mechanical remediation and certainly CDF would logically fit into any of those kind of deep ripping changes. Um, trafficking may change the abundance of soil biology, um, which then further affects the yields, and the previous talk also talked about that. And I suppose to me, for further understanding, for further evidence around um, how CTF works and where it will and won't work, we need to start incorporating this data into uh, models uh, that can be translate the data over greater seasons and greater soil types. I'd just uh, like to add one thanks to what Chris did at acknowledgements at the beginning. It's not only have we had a lot of farmer groups and a huge amount of participation, we've also had a, a large, very large number of growers who have been really enthusiastically involved in this project and without their help and without their permission to go and uh, compact pots of this lovely paddocks and things like that, this project wouldn't have been possible. So a big thanks to all the growers that also <laughs> participated. Thank you.